Okay, good morning everyone. We will start with Tatiana Bilbao today. Please welcome Tatiana Bilbao. Good morning everybody, thank you. Thank you for being here so early. I hope you are awake a little bit. <laughs> Um, well, I thought I wanted to uh, show some projects. I did a selection. Uh, the projects that could tell a little bit about the, the ethos behind our architecture. Um, I do believe I'm still the naive guy uh, thinking that architecture could, could really change something in our lives. Um, this project, um, we did a, this house for uh, the artist Gabriel Orozco. Well, actually, Gabriel Orozco was the one conceiving the idea for this house, and we helped him build it. Um, this house really changed the way I thought of architecture. It's one of the first projects we did in the office. Um, the story behind this is uh, kind of funny. This is why I'm going to say it, because even for you that are students, it's important. Um, we had no work at all. Uh, we were very young, uh, just out of school, doing competitions in, in every open competition that we could find in the net, we were, we were doing it. We were doing also experimental projects, we were in, uh, doing, uh, promoting a little bit contemporary culture in our country, doing exhibitions and organizing exhibitions and lectures. And one day we decided to design a house for Gabriel Orozco. We admire his work. Gabriel Orozco, for those who you don't know, it's a contemporary artist. He's probably the most important Mexican contemporary artist right now. He, he, he has a whole school in now in Mexico. So like the art now being produced in Mexico is absolutely influenced by his work. And uh, when, like, uh, when we were out of, the, of school, very, people, very few people in Mexico knew his work. We knew it very well. And we decided to design a house for him. We didn't knew him, but we decided to do a house for him. And, um, and when we, we, did, we had the design, we did beautiful models. We, we, we were searching for him. We found him. We got a meeting with him. We presented the house. Obviously, it was an utopic idea. It was never built, but he laughed. He, he had fun, he decided to follow a little bit the project for two or three more meetings. And then five years after, he arrived to my office with a little model saying, Tatiana, you need to help me with this. So you never know who you work for. Um, so when you're a student, try everything. You never know where you're going to end. Uh, so this house, um, it's a copy of uh, the, the, the scheme, is a copy of a uh, observatory in India, the Yantar Mantar, and um, it's a very simple uh, plan. The, the center used to be the observatory point, and the rooms were to be uh, the study rooms for, for the observatory. So what we did is was a very simple translation of this scheme into a, a vacation home in the shores of Oaxaca. But I think that the most important part, obviously working with Gabriel Orozco for, for three years was very important for the process in the office. But I think that the most important part of it was what we learned from it. Um, we worked in this very remote place, so bringing everything there, the materials, the people to build it was kind of difficult. It was a, an extreme case, but anyhow, we were building with people that had no technical skills. And at the beginning was kind of, well, yeah, we're in this remote place, we are uh, doing uh, this extreme house in the middle of nowhere, uh, obviously this is going to be difficult. But when we realized that actually this is the people that we work normally in Mexico, then we started to understand many things. And I think that... Uh, one of the most important lessons that we had during these um, three years was that to understand that in, in countries like ours, it's super important to think who is going to build our, our, our architecture, who's, who's crafting it. Uh, because in our case, it's, it's a craft. It's a handcraft. 
Although I, I was out of school um, in the moment of globalization in Mexico, and I really wanted to do digital architecture, I started to work with uh, experimenting with the geometry and trying to do crazy things, uh, structures. When you realize you're in your context and you find out that these people are the ones that are going to build your buildings, you think twice. And this is what we did. We understood that the craftsman uh, was very important for our work and that if we could understand what are the capabilities of this hand labor, we could really do architecture that has a little bit more congruence with with, with, uh, with who we are, with who, who I am, and who, who is the one that is going to use it, and where is the place that it is. So I think that this uh, lesson uh, has been uh, really changing. Before, as I said, we were trying to think on how we could do architecture with a different geometry. At the moment, we, after this, we are not doing these experiments. Um, the house, uh, I could go on with the story of the house. Uh, at the beginning, I was kind of um, very skeptical about how Gabriel wanted to really copy a scheme of an observatory. I wanted to even convince him not to do that and to even think on the elements of this, um, of this composition to do a new house. But at the end, I realized um, well, after obviously Gabriel said, well, Tatiana, this is part of my work. You want to do it with me or not? And I said, okay, okay, we do it. But at the end, I understood that it was really uh, amazing how obviously someone so sensitive as Gabriel Orozco and so aware and obviously understanding about architecture could really uh, choose a scheme that fits perfectly to his family. He, he really... Um, uh, did that in a very unconscious way because at the end when we were uh, ha when the family was habitating the house we realized that and I asked him if he had thought that uh, it was actually the perfect um, scheme for his way of life and he never thought of it consciously and we realized only until the house was built so also that was that was a surprise for me being um, coming from a person like Gabriel and also kind of sensibilize us to in, in several ways, no? Uh, this house uh, that we did um, probably eight years ago in the mountains of Monterrey. Monterrey is like the second largest city in Mexico, in the north of the country, an industrial city. Uh, it's a house that um, the client, uh, when, when he proposes to design it, he wanted a house uh, in this hill that could be a one floor house, a flat house. So I said, well, we have a problem. You have a hill, an incredible hill, and you have a house of a thousand square meters that it's flat. Or we're gonna have to do a structure that flies out, or we're gonna have to do, dig the mountain, half the mountain to create that. So I, I wanted to understand why the client wanted a house, a flat house. And what he wanted was actually a house that could have a certain kind of fluidity. So a place that he could uh, um, not have like a division of two areas, having a house of two floors. And what we did is, uh, so when, then we decided to create a structure with a system uh, starting from a pentagon that could adapt to the topography and that every space uh, connected to the next one would only be in a difference of one or two steps. So all the house flows in a way that uh, from every space to the next one you have to step up a little bit, but you never have to step the whole one floor. There is an escape route and you can really go in one uh, set of stairs. But the idea completely, uh, the, the complete idea is that the house it's really attached to the topography and uh, responding to the, to the geography almost of the place in a way that the, uh, that the house could fit there and could flow as the client wanted it to flow. Um, in a way, we think that uh, it is very important to understand these ideas that the, or these, uh, these things that the client has in their mind 
because th that's the only way to make architecture. And I think that uh, in this house is a representation of that. Uh, this client, she arrived in the office um, asking for a house. She described her site, beautiful site in front of a lake. There's a lake um, here, a beautiful huge lake, Lake of Chapala. This is uh, near the, sec the third largest city in, in Mexico, which is named Guadalajara. And um, the, the, the client uh, describes a beautiful site, wonderful idea she wanted for a weekend house of um, more or less, when she described it, sounded like a 400 square meter house uh, with a huge ba be three bedroom house, you know, a studio, double height living room, incredible views. And then when she was leaving the office, she said, well, you know what, I only have 100,000 euros to build it. And then I was the whole night thinking, well, we have a problem. Or she increases the budget in double at least, or we decrease the program in half at least, because we cannot do this house she describes with the budget she has. And then the next morning when I was about to call her, I, I thought, well, if we do that, we're not going to do architecture. And she's going to hire a local guy to build the house she wants with the money she wants, or intending to do that. And, uh, and everything is going to be not good for us, not good for her. Why don't we try to do it? So we started thinking what would be a material that would allow us to create a house of that size with that budget. And so we started, OK, discarding materials. Obviously, in Mexico, wood is not, a, is not a, an issue. Wood, it's super expensive. It's not suitable to build. So wood is out of the question. Uh, bricks, they need a substructure. They need a finish, normally. Or if not, they need a very expensive um, uh, way of building. Then concrete, obviously, super expensive, no way. Other materials, more panel-like things, we are not comfortable with. So we thought, why don't we explore the earth, the earth of the site? So we, we'd never built before with the earth. Um, and uh, so I started learning on the technique. And so the first... Um, steps of the design of this house was first to understand what would be the material that would allow us to do this. Secondly, the material, how does it work? What are the normal conditions of the material for it to not be more expensive than it is? Because we needed to use it as it is, not, ex not explode all the, their, the capacities of the material because we couldn't extend more the budget. So. Um, so we understood the constraints, we understood the, the possibilities with the normal use of the material, the, the spams that we were allowed to do, the, the modu modularity that we had to, and we created a very simple scheme um, with uh, four squares over, posed uh, uh, within each other. Um, that what, the two that are parallel to the lake, the lake is here, sorry that I'm not showing the lake, um, uh, are the ones that are holding the public, the more public program and the more private pro program in the house. And the two of our imposed squares are only circulation spaces, exterior terraces, etc. The whole house has a, is uh, being held like the structure with the earth. And this is something that uh, I think it shows a lot about our architecture. We're very lucky to live in a country where the, temp the, the weather allows us to, do, to use one material for everything. We don't need to do double walls for um, temperature issues because we, uh, we have an incredible average temperature that doesn't go very high, doesn't go very low in many places in Mexico, not in the whole country. But this is the case here. So we are able to use one material that is everything. So this is a, wa a wall or a house made of earth, that it's only earth, and the earth becomes everything, becomes the structural um, definition, the aesthetical definition, the insulation, the acoustics, everything works very well with this thickness of the same material. Um, we also wanted it to um, 
remark the idea of uh, the, the, the Earth being placed in layers. So we, we did chose different types of Earth to combine it and to create this layering of colors on purpose. Actually, even just in the, in the beginning of the, or in the lower part of the, the, the section, to also give a sense of, of scale. Um, the, obviously, the interiors are very, very simple. The house is super uh, simple because we wanted to achieve the house in the budget, within the budget, with the size she proposed. Um, but uh, obviously, we, we, we couldn't arrive to everything, no? Here you see two uh, steel structures. They're not the structure of the house. They are actually the, the water that is going down from the rainwater from the, from the roofs, the tilted roofs. Um, I think that at the end, uh, we achieved the, the, the goal. We built a house. The client uh, really liked her house. She was very involved since the beginning to under, understanding the material with us. And, uh, and now we are building her, uh, her um, home in Guadalajara, her everyday home in Guadalajara. In, in a way, we're also thinking on how to um, uh, define domesticity. We're thinking on how we are uh, going to, to think about living and about uh, life in, in a place. And we were able to, we were given the opportunity to explore this in a project that we're doing that it's named Solo Houses. I don't know if you have heard of it. It's, um, set of houses done by different architects in, in the north of Barcelona, well, in the, in the border between Catalonia and Aragon in, its, in Spain. Uh, there, are projects, uh, the, there are projects from different architects. There's a house already built by Petzo von Ehrlichhausen, and um, there's projects from Studio Mumbai and Su Fujimoto, and we're doing one project there. And, um, the, the idea of this project is to to exactly that. The client wants the architects to explore uh, a definition of domesticity that they wanted to explore. So it's a completely free uh, project. Uh, we don't have a specific client, so we don't know who's going to leave this house. And that's one of the ideas of this place. And uh, so we, we decided to understand it as a as a place of contemplation. This is a beautiful site. Uh, it, it is in, in the middle of nowhere. It, uh, it, it was an old plantation of olives. And uh, the, it has a very special topography. So we wanted to take advantage of that, creating this structure um, in a way to explore the moment, the different moments of, of the place in, in very different uh, ways. We created like a, a, a passage that could resemble the passage of life while you are living it. Um, unfortunately, this uh, structure was not approved by the, um, by the municipality and we had to change the scheme. But we wanted to also explore the same things and the same ideas on how to uh, invade a landscape and at the same time living it and live in it, live, really live in it, and remark the idea of life as a passage there. And so we created a structure that has um, l the little rooms for modules or rooms spread out in the landscape, also in different points, in different uh, moments of the place, to uh, create this uh, also kind of tension between the landscape and the structure. And this one was approved and is the one that it's going to be built. So every, every single module has a specific moment um, and a specific program. Uh, but the whole idea is that, the, the, that every place, every person can ha find its place around it. Another project that we just recently finished, um, and it's about uh, uh, a person trying to do a weekend house as well in the same mountain where the first house that I showed. Um, 
she wanted to have a very small structure that could really allow her to um, leave the forest and have the forest in her house. We uh, did a simple scheme of three uh, separate uh, structures. Uh, there are three structures that hold the public space and two others that hold rooms. We created uh, uh, the three structures that are in, um, uh, built in a con contract position of each other. And the whole idea is that they are using three materials, which is ceramics, glass, and wood. So the main, uh, or the, 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 the pavilion that holds the public area, it's built in glass in the exterior. The interior has, uh, uh, has this uh, ceramic going into the house and uh, combined with the final touches of the wood in certain moments. Then the pavilion that uh, holds the rooms is done completely in, um, in ceramic. So the, the walls are with these ceramic tiles that we, that we did specially for the house. Then the interior is in wood, and then the glass that uh, creates the, the, the relationship with the landscape. Um, the tile we did it is, uh, is a special tile that we did for this house. Our idea was to be a section of a tile of a roof. At the end, we decided to do it specifically for this house because the client wanted in a specific color. And, um, and the, the tile becomes a, a bit a theme and it becomes everything, no? Sorry. Uh, here you can see it that we, we transform the tile into the floor, but also, uh, again, into the screens that protect you from the sun, but also uh, in, the, in the example, in the rooms, they become the walls. No? Sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction because I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Here. So the, the tiles also become the wall in the exterior. As I mentioned before, we have the opportunity to be able to build like this because we don't need to insulate the walls. The temperature is really, really steady. Even in this place, it looks like a forest. It is a forest, but it's a forest that has an average temperature of 22 degrees the whole year. Uh, so this allows us every, uh, all the time to create structures that really can play with materials and and composition. This is something that we have because of the weather. Um, I think that uh, this is one of the most important projects we have in the office. Uh, it's a botanical garden, and um, it is a botanical garden that exists in a city named Culiacán. Culiacán is a city that in Mexico we know it because it's the capital of the drugs. The, drug, the most important drug dealers from Mexico uh, are in this city. They are the most powerful. The drug cartels actually like were born in this city. Um, so it is a very heavy weight in society, obviously. So they, the, the city is very rich, more than average in Mexico. They have obviously these very bad income from drugs and very good incomes from um, businessmen that are obviously, of course, being benefited by the wealth in society that uh, are doing completely different businesses. So it's really like a rich region. Uh, it, everything comes from ag agriculture. It's a, a rich agriculture place. And uh, agriculture, this is why there were incredible opportunities for drug dealers to start uh, doing uh, drugs there. Actually, the story is very long. The United States was supporting to the, the, um, the production of opium uh, during uh, the, the Vietnam War. And this is when everything really started to become uh, a drug place. But uh, so, there are very important businessmen in the city that want to transform this vision of the city. 
And this is one of the guys. He owns a very important contemporary art collection. And he decided to uh, support the local botanical garden. Um, and in the beginning, he, he created a board of patrons. He invited different people. He's the president of the board uh, of this garden that it's really like a place of uh, identification for the society. It's a really important place for the city. It's not only for education, but for recreation, uh, for sports. There's people there really even taking pictures of their uh, most important days in life. In Mexico, it's a very important celebration when you turn out, uh, when you turn on 15 years. And so people go there to, to really take those pictures. And we were called to, to do a, a project here. In the beginning, when we arrived, um, we saw this place 12 years ago um, that was done very intu intuitively, like a mess, no? With our architecture mind, we said, oh my god, this, this needs to have really an order, how we're going to intervene here. Uh, it's not even classified, botanically speaking. And uh, so we started thinking, what are we going to do with this place? We need to create really um, first an order, then to intervene. No? That was our, our normal mind. So we did. We even uh, um, found the idea, instead of creating a grid to, to, to arrange everything, we traced the branches of a tree, the Wanakasle tree that exists there, and we overlapped it with the, um, with the existing garden, and, uh, and we created a master plan this way. Very, very simple. And then we started to think on the programs. The client wanted us to, to do a program of um, library, uh, auditorium, uh, room for kids, ex uh, laboratories and areas for the garden, but also areas for the, to accommodate the new program that the garden was going to hold. His idea was to bring a contemporary, a parts of his con collection, contemporary art collection, into the garden. So people at the same time that would visit the, 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 the garden would really interact with art pieces. We started then thinking how to, how to do that. We decided to break the program in the most possible breakable parts. And we decided to spread out the program uh, in, the, in the garden uh, based on our idea of master plan all over. We also created different little interventions like, um, uh, like this, the, the water pond existed, but we created the connection and we completely changed the whole um, idea of visiting the park just by adding this collection, connection or we inserted a, a, a pond, a water pond, that really created a new ecosystem for the bamboo area that allow us to introduce even more species that they had, than they had, or a resting point that we only added hammocks that is now one of the most, obviously, there are people waiting for people to stand up from the, from the hammocks to, to use it. Or, for example, the case of yoga. When we decided to, to intervene in this garden, we said, oh, perfect, they do yoga. Let's do a yoga stand kiosk. It's going to be beautiful with the, with the surroundings. And then a, a gardener that was there was hearing what we were saying. And he said, are you really going to create a yoga place? And we're like, yes, imagine. This is great. And he said, why? Well, people do yoga. And then he just went out, and for me, it struck me in my head. And then I thought, yeah, he's really right. If we do a yoga place, we're going to kill the activity. All of a sudden, people are going to start uh, fighting for the place. They're going to start uh, doing lists. How are they, who is going to do the class? This is a totally spontaneous class. Nobody has a schedule. Nobody planned it. Or, well, they did, they, but they're friends. And um, so we decided only to protect the areas and leave the garden to be used the same way it was used. I think that was a key moment as, as well. And to only uh, to, to create decisions that would only enhance the activities that happened there, but not to impose nothing. 
As for example, we decided to just open the uh, irrigation system that it, so it's uh, so it's possible to be to be viewed, to be enjoyed, but not nothing else, not direct your attention to it, not not uh, interpose anything or open little paths in places where they were not to really discover points that grew up completely um, uh, uh, without a planning or uh, really place even uh, some species that would enhance the some others or, or would help to the ecosystem but do very small interventions in a place that we thought at the beginning was completely a mess uh, to just reinforce the idea uh, and the place that, the, the, that it is a place that is recognizable by, for the people. No? We, the art does the same. And uh, this was, I don't, this was um, the job of the curator, Patrick Charpenel, who decided not to place uh, works of the collection of the, of the client, but to commission artists that were already in his collection to do a specific work for the garden. So pieces like this from Alora and Calzadilla obviously create actions every day like these ones, or even important pieces like this one is a pavilion from Dan Graham, who becomes the scenario for the photos of these people for their wedding. No? I think that uh, this was incredible, a clever move uh, for really in the introduction of art, contemporary art, to this society. This is a piece from Francis Alice, who's a Belgium um, living in Mexico artist, very, very well known, that he decided to give death to his bocho, that that's how we call these beetles in, in Mexico, in the garden. And obviously, imagine what these people were asking. It's like, why in the world this guy would leave, drunk guy could enter our garden and crash his car, no? And this is, um, this picture I took and I heard them saying this. And uh, for me, this moment I realized how important was to really introduce art this way to this society. We could have done with the same budget, a beautiful white cube, perfectly controlled museum. Uh, we could have built it there. We could have had an incredible collection of pieces like this one from Olafur Eliasson, Francis Alice, Gabriel Orozco, Dan Graham, James Turrell. We have them all. There's 42 artists doing works there that are amazing. And if we would have done uh, that, we're, we would have had an empty room. People would have not definitely go to the museum. People in this city have no Contact, uh, contact with art are all in their lives. There's no museums in Culiacán, actually. Uh, so these people are not, a, not a comfortable to go into a museum. When they see these institutions, museum, white cubes, they feel completely ne neglected, rejected, and they don't enter. So I think that in a way, this uh, idea of uh, having art that accompanies an everyday activity, that obviously contemporary art can do that, is an amazing way of introducing art to the society. So in a way, thinking on how to import systems like art into a society, it needs to be, in our case, was completely um, not thought. But I think it needs to be thought, and I think this is a reflection that we started to do with this garden when we, when we think on that, how to import things in this globalized world, but how to translate them into the place that you are. Not only in terms of what I said about a handcraft thinking, but also in terms of social thinking, no? It's not the same, as I said. I mean, probably if we were here uh, in any part of Europe where culture is really a thing, this sounds crazy, you know? Having a rich and long structure being used for a picnic. But in our society, this really becomes important. It really becomes part of a, an understanding of art that it's in a, in a very different way. This is a piece from an artist named Teresa Margolles. She is from Culiacán, and she did these benches with the water uh, poured 
uh, water that was used to wash bodies of people shot by the or killed uh, in, in troubles from the drug dealers. So uh, these ladies that are very uh, regular users of the garden were using this piece for a year. They didn't know that the piece was done like that. And when, she, when they found out, it was a big scandal. They called the media, they called the government. And uh, so the garden did a lecture of the artists in the garden. And uh, so they, at the end, understood the piece, and now they're the biggest fans of the piece, of the garden, and promoting art in the garden even more. Uh, this is a way, again, how art is reacting to, towards this society, and this society is reacting towards the art. Uh, there's pieces like Atelier Van Lieshout, uh, and as I said, there are many, many others that are being installed, there's 42. Our buildings are also, the idea of our buildings or our little structured pavilions in the garden are also kind of trying to respond to or to be there, uh, placed uh, as spontaneous as possible as the rest of the garden is. In this case, they wanted a room that would allow people to have a, a seven minute video, introductory video of the garden. And what we did is we decided to create an open auditorium. At the beginning, this was obviously a scandal. They didn't want it. They wanted a closed room with air conditioning. Uh, in this case, the weather is super hot. And we decided to convince them to create structures that we really uh, are able to, to allow people always to first remember and remind them they're in a botanical garden. They're in this garden. They're not, they don't need to be immersed in a place that they uh, that they could be in the rest of the city, and also that they could be used in different ways and not to direct specifically uh, the idea and to continue with the idea of this spontaneous use of, of things you know, in the garden. So here we created a simple open auditorium that it's only marked by the walls that would allow a little bit of privacy from, from, from when there's a screen. Uh, or, but the, and, and, and that can be used for different things. The, the rest of the, the structures that have the same principle. The idea is that you are always reminded that you're in a botanical garden. So what we did is we created um, groups of, uh, of little pavilions that are grouped because of functional issues, but they're also detached. So uh, in a way that you are only in one of the places using one of the programs, and if you need another one, you need to exit, go out, and change the structure in order for you to really make this procession that you are in a garden, and when you exit, you're really feeling the weather, the temperature, the, the noise, the birds, the rain, whatever is happening out there. So in this case, the group is, we call it the educational facility. There's a room for kids and workshops. There's a little auditorium, and then there's the service area. Um, all the structures uh, in this case were built before Gabriel Orozco, so you can see the search on geometries. Uh, but the idea is also the same, pursuing a structure that is a simple structure. It becomes the wall, becomes everything, becomes the structure, the, 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 the aesthetic definition, the, the um, the insulation and and everything at the end. No, art also has been in dialogue with architecture. In this case, this is a piece from Tercero Quinto. For, from Tercero Quinto, what that they did, they buried the ruins of the a hut that was there, and um, and it's a little uh, playground for kids. Um, the principle of, uh, of, of, the, of the garden has been exploded in many ways. We're just finishing other pavilions that were designed at that time, like this is the entrance. Um, and we are also designing and adding new pavilions in, in a way that we wanted to keep the same principles, like these ones about dividing the program in the most divisible possible way. So you have also a structure that is composed of little pavilions, so it's the same principle. But in this case, since we designed it uh, this five years ago, 
we decided to pursue a different um, aesthetic approach. And in this case, we're using, again, our principles of using the material to being very direct, using it for everything, the structure, the aesthetic definition, the insulation, but also, uh, in this case, doing a more completed geometric um, architecture that uh, embraces a little bit our new way of thinking in, in doing architecture. In this case, we're using, instead of concrete, we're using uh, concrete bricks. Um, and uh, these are going to be finished very, very soon. Uh, in this project, as I said before, I think the whole um, importance of it relies on the idea on how this uh, existing place becomes something to totally different, but with the uh, with the principles that the the, the place was conceived. No, the 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 super um, informal way of building it. The also the the more open structures and the more idea of integration with the people and the um, organity that the people bring to the project. Um, we did another project uh, in, the shore, uh, in the hills of Jalisco, that it's a pilgrimage route, uh, a small master plan, that in this case what we did is was uh, thinking and understanding a little bit that this was a very complex project in the middle of nowhere with a very, very little budget. And that uh, it was kind of difficult to think that we were going to be doing all these structures. It's a pilgrimage route, a little bit like the Compostela, Santiago de Compostela pilgrimage route in Spain, but in a completely smaller scale. It's uh, more or less 150 kilometers long. Uh, every year, more or less 3 million people walk this route. Uh, to arrive at the end to a, to a church that has a virgin of rosary, that they, they pray, they bring their miracles to her, and they, they bring their wishes to her. So um, this uh, was uh, the government of Jalisco invited us to create uh, a master plan that would allow uh, different in, small interventions along the route that could become points of interest, but also like um, a spiritual point that could really uh, enhance a little bit the economy of the place because these little towns that surround this route obviously live because of that. Uh, that has, has never had um, an intervention before. People from the little towns are the ones giving their services or creating their little structures even here in the middle of, of, the, of the route. And, um, and that it's a very traditional uh, and spiritual moment for people, no? So it is, it is a very important place. And what we thought is that uh, we wanted to invite different people from different parts of the world to create one of these little structures. We thought it was important to have um, an intervention with a different view uh, from people that really have even uh, uh, roots of not, not non-Catholic roots. This is a Catholic root, I forgot to say in the beginning. And we, so we created a master plan. And when I say we, it was, uh, I invited Derek Delecam, who's another Mexican architect. And together we decided to create a master plan, help the government to understand where they could, they could place shelters, water supplies, trash containers, medical services, but also where they could place these uh, focal points, uh, uh, viewpoints, or spiritual points. And then, uh, so we invited for those different architects, as I said before, um, and uh, we kind of did, uh, we did the walk with these architects a little bit. And what we did is we decided all together what was going to do who, and who was going to do where. And uh, it's basically look, of, look at points or sanctuaries around the, the, the route. There are architects like uh, Derek and, and Rosana did a project, uh, Alejandra Aravena did another one, HHF, Luis Aldrete, uh, Weiwei, Kristen Gantenbein, and we also did with Derek something together. The first point that we did is um, the government wanted a statue that commemorate like the beginning of the route. 
And um, so we did, uh, uh, obviously, we wanted to use the most representative symbol of Catholicism, which is the cross. And we did a very simple gesture of creating like the, um, virtually the cross with four walls, obviously in a um, very um, uh, homage to uh, uh, Matthias Geritz, who's a, an important artist, uh, German artist working in Mexico in the 50s and 60s with Luis Barragan. And we created this open chapel that it's uh, in, uh, in a side of a, of a little town that could hold also different types of, uh, uh, of, for example, a mass for the little town when this pilgrimage is not happening, but also that could become a recognizable point from a, from, from a, from a way, from a, from a part, no? Uh, we also like the idea that from this point you can see the next one, but also from the next one you can see this one. In this way you can start to identify yourself within the root. And the next point, uh, it, uh, it's a uh, kind of a column done by Kristen Gantenbein. I don't know if Chris, Christoph is going to show it and then he one can describe it. But if not, it's just a column. It's a beautiful uh, structure that remarks the, one of the highest point, points of the hill, but also that has an impressive uh, and important interior space that can become also kind of a little spiritual retreat in the interior. The next point, which you don't see from afar, is a wall uh, that goes like into the landscape and out to the, to the last landscape in a way of like introducing your individuality to yourself and exposing yourself to the exterior, more, more kind of uh, spiritually like that, done by Ai Weiwei. Um, and shelters that there are right now two build or eight design spread out along the route that we basically did them on purpose be, besides little towns. So they are used in different ways when the pilgrimage is not happening. A lookout point by HHF um, or uh, one of the, uh, the highest point as well from the pilgrimage route by um, Alejandro Aravena. And the last point you encounter from the route is a circle that encircles the landscape done by Rosana and Derek, uh, Rosana Montiel and Derek Deleca. And, um, and in this case, then afterwards you arrive to the, to the church, which uh, unfortunately is not so, uh, architecturally not so important, but spiritually for these people is absolutely important. I think that in this route, the, the essential uh, point was that the people was never taken in account. So the, the first time that the people went back to the pilgrimage route, now with the structures, we were really afraid on what was going to happen. We really thought that it was very difficult to understand the, the, the procession, the spiritual moment of these people uh, to design. We actually never did. So it was kind of an experiment, and we, when the first year that the pilgrims arrived after the route was finally had some structures, the people were happy because they felt taken care. There was never an intervention from the government in this place. So it was amazing that it was really almost as if we could have done anything. I mean, we couldn't, but... It was, because the people were uh, amazed just by the fact that they had things now. They had someone paid attention to them. And so this also made us realize how important is, is that. It, it is just a simple thing that we were even thinking, oh, we're going to disturb their morality and their spirituality, and we're going to mess with, with their religion and these things. And that was not important. This was much more important, the pseudo things that we never thought. Um, we're working in several different projects, but also at the same time we're trying to, and this is a market in the middle of a very busy district in Mexico City, and we're starting to think how we could really erase this way of representing our projects and present them probably in a more simple, direct, honest way. This is um, uh, a concert hall 
in, uh, in, a, in, a na in a place named Irapuato. Uh, and to understand if we could do models or, uh, or images that really um, are much more expressive. And the way we, um, we think of our architecture can be represented. No? We don't think render-like, so why would you want to do renders? In this case, this is a, an image for a competition. It's not uh, only the idea of representing it differently, but we wanted to create a building. We, we lost this competition. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it, it was in New York. It was an, a very uh, important restricted competition for seven teams. Um, and we, we wanted to, to, under, uh, to, to start understanding if there's another possibility of creating a vertical structure that, uh, which is a little bit the topic of the, of the studio here, a vertical structure that can have um, a different idea of this skyscraper typology. And if we could introduce really public space that really cuts the, the structure, goes completely into it, and that it's open, and that it's part of the city, that it's really something that uh, the city immerses itself in the building, uh, the client wanted to have a very uh, secured building, but they didn't want it to gentrify the area. So we decided to create a structure that would really introduce the area into the building, and I think that that's what scares them. No? But we're also starting to think if there's a different type of verticality. We were invited to do the cover for Domo's four years ago, or two, I don't remember when. Um, and we decided to do a cadavre skis with different architects, also Kristen Gandemain <laughs> did one part of, the, uh, of, the, of this. This was done exactly like a cadavre skis, HHF, Derek Delecan, Kristen Gandemain, and, and ourselves. And in this way, we are starting to develop a project in Guatemala, which is a, a tower that has four different uses. And we're trying to understand if it's, it's possible to, to have the four different uses, not only as different floors, but also as different expressions. And we're in a way of understanding if we can do that. We're still struggling, uh, struggling also with the client. But I think that the possibility of thinking on how we can make a vertical structure more diverse and more able to, to, ha to really be part of a city we're going to be doing successful cities in the future because we need it. We need density and we need structures that are really more absorbing and promoting the social and community uh, expression in a city, but in the vertical realm. Um, one of, I'm, this is the last project I'm going to present. I'm going to be quick. I know I, I'm still stealing your time, Christoph. But, uh, but I will be quick. Uh, I, I, this is a, a, a very important part of the office. It's an ongoing research since eight years ago. We're studying uh, housing in Mexico, which is a topic that it's really, really, um, for me, really an urgent matter, actually. The, city, the cities in Mexico have grown exponentially uh, and absolutely informally. They have invaded the, the hills uh, in a very uh, informal way, which sometimes creates some kind of important richness for the place, but it's completely uninformed, uh, unaware. The government is completely, it's completely out of hands. No? The problem of housing is huge. There's 11 million people uh, living in uh, informal settlements, not like these ones. These ones are not even considered informal. Uh, informal settlements like huts or, or board houses or even tents um, in the country, in the whole country. And the, the, the answer for it from the government has not been really successful. Unfortunately, uh, the government followed a model produced in the US that it's very rep well represented uh, with this image of a place named Leviton. 
I don't know if you know, know Levittown. Uh, Levittown is a place, uh, a middle class neighborhood that was built in the 40s uh, by a developer that uh, all of a sudden became very successful because he created this ideal life of a suburb for a masses, no? so for middle class people. Um, they, so they created these kind of ghettos, suburbs, I call them ghettos, uh, with almost identical houses, and they were very financially successful. So um, they created in a way this dream life for people of owning a house, a little house with a loan, with a backyard and a front garage with, uh, attached to the street, creating like the idea of ideal life. And Mexico City copied, uh, but with, it, with our means and our economy, and it's really creating a terrible thing. Uh, 12 million people are living in these units, these units that are spread out in the whole country. They're units that sometimes, like these ones, are 20,000 units of identical houses of 43 to some of these houses have up to 85 square meters. So they're very, very small houses. They don't have any other um, program besides housing, so they're dormitory places. And the, the most important problem is that they are completely detached from the urban centers. They are far away from the cities. They are built in obviously cheap lands outside the cities. They're suburbs, but the problem here is that uh, the suburbs in the U.S. created for middle class, working class people, uh, they're connected, they have infrastructure to arrive to cities, they are connected to schools, edu so education, health, uh, etc. In Mexico, these places are completely detached from working areas, education, health services, and very few people own cars. So they cannot arrive to these places, transport is not there, has not arrived in many cases. And the problem is huge. This is all over the country. Uh, it doesn't matter if they're painted in rainbow colors, it's still the same problem, no? Uh, they are, many of these places, completely abandoned because obviously this is not the correct model. The problem here, versus the, the model in, in the United States, which is also not ideal, is that these programs are social housing. So these programs are the ones that the government is supporting, subsidizing, for, pe for people that have very low income, and they buy these houses with a credit, with a very small credit that the government um, uh, subsidizes for years. So this is the biggest problem for me, because if not well, the free market can do whatever they want. I, I don't agree completely, but they can do whatever they want, and if people buy it, well, there's people problems. But in this case, it's subsidized by the government. So, and this is the problem, no? This is where the problem begins. I think that, the, that the, the one of the most important problems with it is that these people are really uh, losing their identity. When you live in a, in a place like this, you become a number. And when you become a number, you're not part of society. You can be anything, a row of blocks in the middle of nowhere. And as I said, they're being sold like the dream house, no? like the, the, the model in the US. People really believe it when they realize it's a nightmare. They, these, normally these places are in, in municipalities where normally they would live 5,000 people. All of a sudden 20,000 houses arrive, so 60,000 people arrive to live in this municipality. The municipality doesn't have money because the taxes in Mexico are not distributed by number of people living in the place. The distribution is completely different. So the municipality doesn't have money at all to <coughs> maintain these places. So forget about uh, cleaning the streets, lights in the streets, trash, well, security, in no way. There's no police around it. People obviously have started to adapt 
their lives into these places, but it is really not ideal. And for me, as I said, the most important thing is the loss of identity. This is going to be a very big problem. I mean, after all the other problems that there are, this is going to be a very big problem for, for years to come. 12 million people is 10% of the population in Mexico already in this problem. When you lose your, uh, your importance in society, you can become anywhere, a criminal, a no one, uh, you know? So it's really hard to bring these people really back. The second problem that it's also very, very hard is that the cities are growing where the developers are developing these places because there's so many people that then these satellite places need, need uh, infrastructure to arrive, they need schools, and they are not then allowing the, 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 city, the cities to densify. I, uh, I'm starting to, uh, to be able, finally, to communicate with the government. Uh, we, uh, we are like a set of 20 architects trying to do it by making them understand that uh, it's not only the, the house, because until now, the rules to developers are that they have to respect the amount of square meters, minimum square meters for a room, minimum height for a, for a place, but they don't really uh, have anything else to respect the developers. So this is why these places are right like that. But I'm always saying it doesn't matter that much this little box, white box, than the surroundings. Because in 43 square meters, obviously there's very little you can do to make it completely incredible. You can, there are obviously, it could be a really horrible box or it could be a comfortable 43 square meter box. But why in the world you buy an apartment in New York for millions of dollars of 43 square meters in the middle of Manhattan that it's really noisy, horrible, old, the, the walls are falling apart, why? Because it's Manhattan. Why would you pay that? Because you're living in the, in the city that gives you education, transport, infrastructure, culture, jobs, incredible jobs. When you don't have that, you don't buy that, and you don't live in a place like that. It, you cannot put these places in the middle of nowhere. So the important is what surrounds it. We're starting little by little to work in uh, like that. It's very hard to convince everybody and convince developers, but we have understood that if we, in the beginning we were like, no, this is all wrong, no? And when you arrive and say to anybody, the developer or the, or the government, this is all wrong, they close the door and they're like, ah, oh, you're crazy, ciao. Uh, we're doing a big business, bye. And uh, so you have to understand the things behind and try to uh, do things a little bit different. So here we had the opportunity to intervene in a project for 600 houses that was uh, in, uh, in Michoacán, that they had a plan of these row houses. And they said, okay, you can do it, but you can only design the urban dis uh, distribution. The house is going to be designed by the local architect that already designed thousands of those other houses. And we said, okay, we can work with that, because if we can make, uh, make you, the people understand that the, also the situation that where, how you place these houses, be even adapted to the topography, to the geology, you, we could really think on something different. So we did. We created this little neighborhood that uh, we even created a center, uh, uh, little different districts for 600 people. And we, uh, we really achieved even the accidents of the topography. Uh, the houses were not designed by us. Uh, but we decided also to play with the disposition of the houses, not only in the place by not creating these row houses, but also by, by identifying them. So putting one house on top of the other one in the cases more, uh, more close to the, what we call the, 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 the neighborhood center. And this place really became immediately a place that people started to adapt, to identify, to take over, and to really transform. And it was an incredible uh, example of how very little moves with even less cost could really allow uh, better lives to happen, no? So this was the first thing we did. Uh, we're still working in several um, ways. And in, 
in, in the way we were invited to develop a model for a program that it's a, a program from the government for houses that can be built by themselves or that are subsidized and cost very, very little money. This is a house that uh, needs to be 43 square meters in minimum and that has to cost $7,000. So what we did is we created a, a model of a house that would allow you more space, but also that can adapt to different um, weather conditions and situations. So we took a model of a house that we developed years ago in Ordos because we thought it was a, a perfect um, solution for the problem we had. When we w got the commission, the client told us, okay, do you want to take this challenge? We want you to design a house that c can be built by, by the people and or not. It could be assisted, but it has to cost $7,000. It has to enter to this program. And we saw the houses that were in this program that I show a little bit before here. And we saw that they all had one, almost all had one thing that they were, they looked like a house. And we, all of them, we thought they ha were not possible to expand and they were not modular. And then we did a, a little, well, a big actually uh, research on, um, on what, why are these houses like that? And we found out that uh, people wanted houses like look like a house. Why? Because in the realm in Mexico, there's uh, this landscape of houses of one floor with the steel bars out expecting for the second floor to arrive. Before, that was a sign of prosperity. Right now, it's a sign of failure. So people don't want a house that it's flat, has a flat roof because they remind them, they remind that of this uh, possibility of having uh, a, 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 an image of failure. So we said, okay, we need a house that looks like a house. We need a house that it's modular, so it's expandable. So we used the model that we, we had for, for that project. And uh, because it allows us, sorry, it allows the possibility of uh, have uh, the idea of a finished house. Also, they wanted a house that looked finished and that had strong materials. So there, the possibility of a house that looks like a house, but it's not completely finished, so it's expandable, and that it has the possibility of having different materials. So it has a very strong material, and it has some materials that define some other spaces that are more temporary. So we created this model that it's now approved by the government that has many possibilities of configuration depending also on the cultural side of it because the people in the south of the country really don't like a steady interior kitchens or people in the north of the country they really need something more like a shelter because the weather is more extreme. So this is adaptable to different conditions, different situations and the, the house is expandable even from the, for, them, from the, for themselves, they can build the expansion and, uh, and it's easy also to build. We have built two prototypes in Chiapas, which are these two with different materials. Also the material is adaptable to the condition. We built the prototype in Chicago in the biennial, but we also uh, we recently invited to build these 23 houses in a project that, um, again, I don't believe in these units. It's part of the unit, but it was a unit that was hit by a tornado. So we were able to experiment if this house could fix, could fit in a unit, but also if it could be adapted to this type of weather, it could be adapted to this type of conditions of life. And we did, and uh, now they are inhabited and they, people have been adapting themselves, painting the houses, expanding with little rooms, doing the room on the top, and, uh, and, uh, and we have uh, understood that this house is even a better solution for places like this, um, these units that are permitting a house that is even cheaper, allows you to have more piece of land to expand or to, create, or to recreate, and it's built with the same cost of the other houses that you see on the back. And with that, I think I finished my talk. I don't know if there's time for questions or something, but thank you very much.